The South West Coast. Thank you, Acting Speaker. I rise to speak on this bill, which implements a range of budget measures and changes to the state taxation and revenue laws. I note in the second reading, uh, the Treasurer st says that the bill delivers budget initiatives that will continue to the to the continue to the government's commitment to delivering greater benefits to regional Victoria and that the government is a strong supporter of the ag sector. I'll focus most of my contributions on those two points because I believe, having read that, I believe the Treasurer and those on the side of the House, that side of the House, might actually need a bit of an education on regional Victoria. Now, I'm sure the opposite, those opposite will be quick to point out that payroll tax cuts like it's some sort of Hail Mary and will drive through growth into regional Victoria. But you can't just lower one tax and expect people to start employing. The average value of this change is around 40 million a year, while payroll tax has increased by 1 billion a year since the election in 2014. So once again, what we're seeing is smoke and mirrors, hoodwinking. The example I heard before to describe this of um, putting $5 in the plate at church and making a big show of it, but taking out 100 uh, with a swift action that nobody sees is precisely the um, analogy that uh, explains how ridiculous this is. The Department of Treasury and Finance can't even say how many regional businesses will actually meet the criteria for a lower rate of the payroll tax. We know that 4,000 businesses pay payroll tax, but if you can't even work out, you haven't done the analysis to know how the regions will actually benefit, it's all about talking the talk but not really even understanding the effect of what you're uh, doing. So how is it anywhere near being able to walk the walk? The government has made Victoria the highest taxing this government, this government, the Labor Andrews government, has made Victoria the highest taxing state in the country, introducing 13 new taxes and charges since the last election, despite the Premier saying that he would not. And he's driven the cost of living pressures through the roof on households. That's the direct result of raising taxes. You've affected mothers, fathers, families, you've affected businesses, you've affected workers. How is this what they purport to be supportive of? In fact, it's again smoke and mirrors, it's not reality. They have affected the cost of living drastically. So why would one tax cut, which is minimal, and we have no idea how many people it affects anyway, encourage businesses to set up in regional Victoria, when there's also a lack of uh, adequate infrastructure in the regions. In South West Coast, our roads are falling apart, our rail service is abysmal, and in great parts of the electorate, we have antiquated energy structure, infrastructure, which limits the ability of businesses to grow and employ. In Tirundara, I'll explain what I mean by the energy infrastructure that is antiquated. Here we have a region, a very productive region, uh, where we have businesses like engineering firms, we have da dairy businesses milking, you know, a uh, thousand cows plus in some of these businesses, but they, as um, businesses within that region, actually have to work together to be able to understand what each is actually doing, because if they all uh, fire up at the same time, they actually can't run their businesses. They can't milk the cows and turn on all the machines in the engineering firm, which is an neighbour of one business I'm referring to, at the same time. So how can that be the most productive um, way forward for those businesses? It's not. Another business um, ran and owned by Bruce Knowles has actually invested in his own diesel generators because the ability to get uh, three-phase power is just not possible. So when we've got a state that it needs to grow um, the economy and understand the benefits that uh, particularly my area brings to the state through revenue, they clearly don't understand that when we haven't even got them understanding that we need basic three-phase power, which you see most countries, all, all countries of the world, um, even third world countries, where we're seeing much more power reliability than we're seeing in southwest Victoria. So Labor has absolutely no understanding of, the reg of regional Victoria and what makes it tick. They can't see past Geelong, Ballarat or Bendigo, places like Warrnambool and Portland half forgotten about, and the enormous potential we have for growth out, out in southwest Victoria to ease the pressure on the city and evenly spread the population across this state is a squandered opportunity. 
South West Victoria is the most productive agricultural region and the second most productive in Victoria and the second most productive in the nation. And that's ABS qualified data. That is not um, me being um, uh, um, uh, making anything up. That is actual facts. And we know it. And we're working hard under very extreme circumstances that reduce our productivity. We have farms, food processes and manufacturing plants. We Agriculture um, provides 60 per cent of the region's income and five, one in five jobs. We have a broad spectrum of those agricultural industries, such as red meat, beef, sheep, abalone, wool, dairy, forestry, um, and like I say, dairy manufacturing as well. Um, we have niche food industries as well, and strong links to the food and tourism sector. So it's a really innovative area, uh, part of the state as well. My region does punch well above its weight in terms of contribution to the state's economy, yet we are forgotten about by this Labor government. So increasing the duty exemption threshold for young farmers is one way and just one way to encourage young farmers into the agricultural in industry. During my time in um, representing farmers in, in my role as a Victorian um, Vice President of Victorian uh, United Dairy Farmers of Victoria and on my, um, in my roles with Victorian Farmers Federation and the Australian Dairy Farmers, we spoke a lot about how it uh, needs to be at least in line with the um, first homeowners grant. So that is good, but it, as the member for Eildon pointed out, it's not going to, um, you can't buy a farm and make a living uh, for 750,000. It's all relative. Whether, like Cindy said, you're out in the west where land is cheaper or where it's more, um, you can put um, more uh, DSC per hectare, which is dry sheep equivalent, which measures how many um, animals or whatever you can grow per acre. It's just a term we use in agriculture. It's all relative to the cost of the land. And $750,000 is not going to buy a young farmer a productive piece of land to make a living on. He's going to be off farm working. She's going to be off farm working. The family are not going to be able to survive on agriculture alone at that level. And there's so that's my point about understanding regional Victoria. There's so much more that can be done. And, uh, and in, 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 in unlocking billions of dollars of untapped productivity for existing and well-established farmers. The Great South Coast Food and Fibre Plan uh, was endorsed by the uh, Labor government last year in the budget with a $500,000 rollout to this comprehensive plan, which I spent a number of years prior to this place helping build, which aims to lift the image of the food and fibre sector, encourage young people to take up a job in the sector and unlock the issues that um, are holding back the region. So it was a regional approach to re find regional solutions to really get the benefit from. Now, they haven't received the money yet, so they've been paying executive officer for 12 months. They've worked on the power um, business case that I've been talking to you about. They've also been working on the water issue. Now, they've done all the economic modelling to show that um, we can unlock, without any environmental effects, um, without any um, um, challenges to the environment. We've been caught up in the Murray-Darling Basin challenge, but we've got underground water there that is already allocate, allocated by hydrological reports that show it's not um, overused and it is not actually used. We have sleeper licences are called people who don't actually use the water. If we unlock even 10% of that, which has no environmental effect um, any more than what we've you know, it, there is none, it's, it's actually a benefit. We get a $55 million boost to the regional economy just by being able to pull that water out of the ground that's already allowed to be pulled out, put onto pasture and turned into fodder to, to produce more um, milk per hectare. The only thing standing in the way is the bureaucracy. The legislation even allows it. It's the, it's the department that's really just not playing ball. And the committee have met with the minister over and over again, who's led them up a garden path. So here is this opportunity. They've got 500,000 they can't get access to. They're paying a CEO who they have no money to do so with because the promise hasn't been delivered. They're not able to do the work they need to do. The opportunity abounds. So remember this government says... This is a government that says it's a strong supporter of the ag industry, yet when push comes to shove, it does nothing that will actually support farmers and help drive economic activity. I will not sit here and listen to the Labor government tell me how they're champions for regional Victoria, because it's not true. 
In the eyes of those opposite, regional Victoria is Geelong, Ballarat and Bendigo. They have zero understanding or respect for the enormous economic contribution our agriculture sector makes to the state's economy. But they are more than happy to take the proceeds and spend them on projects to make life in the city easier. If you're serious about regional Victoria, start addressing the lack of infrastructure, start listening to the people who know what they're talking about and make sensible changes to rules. The move.